just wrapped episode number two for the Real Estate Jam session. Today's episode was on residential real estate from some of the hottest markets around the country. So our panelists was top agents in these markets. So much information, a lot of stuff I didn't even know and I thought I knew everything according to my sisters. But um, great information. Make sure you uh, tune in or you know what, even better yet, subscribe to the channel and that way you won't miss out. Okay. All right, well, what a panel I have here today. Um, all top residential real estate agents around the country. Um, it's hard to get these guys together because they're all so busy right now. Residential real estate's on fire. Uh, we brought this panel together to give everybody inside information about what's going on in each one of these agents, these panelists' marketplace. So, um, panel, thank you for coming in today. I really appreciate it. A lot of great information here. We were just talking uh, prior to coming on and recording about their marketplace, and these guys are all so busy. So I'm anxious to hear all the information uh, that they have. Uh, I do have one sponsor, Commercial Brokers International in Los Angeles. I do have to put out there because they make me. <laughs> but that's it. No ads, no nothing. Um, okay, so what we'll do is just five to ten seconds of introduce yourself, uh, and then give us the updates on your marketplace, you know, your city, what's, you know, what's going on, current sales, leasing numbers, historical data, um, trends looking forward. So just give us that data in each one of your cities, and then we'll open it up to questions. And then at the end of this video, we're going to have all your contact information at the bottom, and then people will be able to reach out to you directly. So, um, all right, well, let's just, let's go ahead and jump right in. Uh, let, me, let me do this real quick. Well, Richard, go ahead. Why don't you just go ahead? Okay, thank you. Richard Wood from Admiral's Cove Realty in Jupiter, Florida. Um, our market may be similar to other people's market. We have a huge lack of inventory here, and it's been very, very difficult the last six months. Um, going over some statistics, the last, I'm going to go over December numbers briefly because that's the last full year. Um, I have some January, which I can jump into, but for instance, December numbers in Jupiter for the year. Um, average sale price up 99.5%. Uh, 692,000 was the average in December of 19, December of 20, a million 382. So of course, um, all the houses didn't go up, didn't double. But the reason we're seeing these big jumps in prices is because um, we've had a lot of redevelopment here and a lot of older homes are getting torn down uh, you know, people are buying properties for two and a half, three million dollars, tearing down and putting up a seven million dollar house. So we're seeing a lot of redevelopment in this neighborhood because uh, most of the property that's been built here uh, was in the 80s, uh, late 70s, 80s, and early 90s, and we're going through a heavy remodel phase in this area. Um, huge lack of inventory. Uh, December of 2019, just for single family homes. And we're a community of about 70,000 people. It's a little smaller, but it's a very high end community. Um, and as I mentioned in the beginning, a lot of people, it's second homes for a lot of people here. Uh, a lot of people moving to Florida and they moved to this area for tax purposes because we live here for over six months out of the year, uh, no federal income tax. So a lot of people are moving here for that purpose. Um, inventory December, 2019, 315 homes on the market. December of 20, 175 homes. As of now, there's only 135 homes on the market. So way down on inventory. Um, What's your average days on market, Richard? Maybe I didn't hear that. Yeah, average days on market. We have um, December, it was about 40 days on market as of median time to contract. And like most of your markets, probably... You know, of course, anything that comes on that's a decent property that's priced well will sell in the first couple of days. There's some unrealistic sellers like in other markets and those things sit around until they decide to get closer to where the, the price is. So very fast moving, moving very frustrating for buyers um, and a great time for sellers here if anybody needs to sell. But we've also seen not a lot of activity because um, uh, people in this, that live in the area have tended to stay put and not move laterally. Uh, because of COVID. So we're seeing people stay put. The, a lot of the market activity in this area is people who need to sell. Either somebody passed away, uh, somebody just moved, totally moved out of the area, and we're getting the big influx of people. Um, 
market conditions here and in Florida, um, and uh, Banna might know this too, we've been seeing a huge increase in people moving last few years, over three, a little over 300,000 people a year added to Florida. And they see that number continuing for at least the next five years. It's about 1.2% increase in um, population. So, you know, there's not a lot of property on the market and there's more people right. moving here. And, uh, you know- Where are they coming from mostly? Uh, our part of, of Florida, so I'm in Northern Palm Beach County. And like I said, I'm about an hour and a half north of Miami. Um, most of the people that come here from the Northeast, they'd be New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Connecticut. We get a good amount of people from the Chicago area. We're starting to see some people from California move out here and, and a lot for tax purposes again. Sure. Um, not many on the Midwest. All the Midwest people tend to go to the West Coast of Florida. So that's kind of our, our area right here. Um, and again, most of the people moving here, a lot of people for tax purposes. They're about to retire. They're retiring and you're a full-time resident after six months and you save all the federal income tax on all your income. So um, that's the residential market, very tight. The residential leasing market here also, very, very tight. I've had 50 calls probably in the last three months if people want to rent seasonally down here. I found one person a proper property that they uh, was suitable. How for. much has that gone up in the last couple of years, last in, year? They, the last year, um, so this is a different, it's not a rental, the residential rental market is different than a lot of cities. It's very seasonal and a lot of people come down here for the winter from December to April, basically. So a lot of people invest in property and the four months they rent out of the year pays for most of the payments for the property for the year. Um, we've seen this year because of COVID and so many people moving here, properties are getting 25 to 30% more than they were getting last year, just because of this year being so unique and everybody wanting to get out of the cities and go to Florida because we can be outside you know, all year round down here. Um, so I wish I had more detailed statistics, but because all the rental statistics, people leave them in the MLS all year long because they're mostly rented out seasonally. So we can't get very accurate numbers, but you know, okay. it's very, very difficult to put somebody in a rental here. So, all right. Well, anybody have any questions for Richard? All right, Banna, we'll stick with Florida. How are you? Good. How are you? Thank you for having me. Um, I mean, what can we say, right? Florida's booming. Um, we've seen a complete, uh, I would say from the last three months, I've seen a complete difference in inventory prices. Uh, I have never seen anything like it. I'm a Miami native myself, so I kind of know the city pretty well. I've seen it growing up. Um, Last year, there's about a thousand people a day moving to South Florida. Now we're looking around 1,500, 1,800 a day. Um, it's crazy what we're what we're really seeing. In terms of numbers, if we look in the chat, I actually uh, included some PDFs, photos, markets, actual market snapshots. Really easy to see. I felt Florida. It being like what number one, number two, top market. We kind of need to see some visuals. So if you click through, you can see exactly what I'm talking about. In terms of inventory, um, condos, we, for our single family homes, we have less than two months, which is insane. Um, in terms of condos, we have about 10 months of condo supply. We are in a seller's market. Um, the trend I'm noticing is definitely from, uh, definitely from New York. New York, Jersey, New England, Connecticut, Chicago, Philadelphia is number one. Number two, I would say we're seeing a lot of Los Angeles from the West Coast. Um, I think that's primary where our, most of our buyers are coming from. Um, price points. So in all of South Florida, I have like the real deal just came out with this amazing stat book right in time for this uh, for this jam session. And also our association does like phenomenal job of providing updated um, updated stats. So in up in January, well, from last year to this year, we're noticing like about a 20 to 30 percent price increase of the median sale price. Um, it really depends on the area, you know, Coral Gables, uh, which is primarily families. Um, 
I would say that's where most people from New York are buying from if they want a single family home with a pool. Price points last year were a million and now we're looking at 1.5. So about a 20, 30% increase in, uh, in prices. For Lauderdale, we're looking at a 17%. Jupiter actually, to touch on you, is 36% increase from last year, median sale price, which you, you also mentioned that. Uh, the beach is looking at 30%. So we're seeing a huge increase overall median sale price. There's no inventory available. Everyone is buying them sight unseen, all cash, most of the, most of the deals as well. Um, I think the low interest rates are also proving to be a huge uh, push in the, in, in the migration to South Florida. We're looking at interest rates at 2.6 right now. Um, so I think all of that's really, really pushing it. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Um, yes. Hey, you think you have a, and I know it's, um, I know the Miami mayor is super open and are, is loving to attract a lot of tech talent, which is really interesting, right? Um, because there's a big, not a big, but there are a good amount of people, especially VCs that have moved uh, to Miami. So are you seeing that just yet or not as much as Miami mayor wants to you know, highlight. Absolutely, absolutely. I actually just saw him. I saw Suarez um, like last week at, at a at a show. He's very out. He's always, he's always out. He's always out experiencing Miami in the shows. And Miami's fully open. You know, I think that's something to talk about as well. Is how Florida is so open from restaurants to limited use of masks to I don't know if you've seen online, but spring break here is in. Insane. So I think all of that is pushing it, and I think he's done a great job in um, bringing over all the tech, uh, all the tech guys. I'm actually releasing an email tomorrow about is if Miami is the new Silicon Valley, just because not only are they relocating themselves, but they're relocating their businesses. So Brickell is now being considered Manhattan of the South. I think downtown is where all the big tech hubs are coming. Are coming. Blackstone came. Um, Spotify is coming. What else? There's a couple of uh, VCs that from tech from, from Silicon Valley that came out and just bought 20, 30, $40 million properties on Venetian Islands. We're seeing prices we've never, ever seen in the city. I had listings myself that were sitting for two years just because there's so much inventory. In a matter of 60 days, from 25 listings to 12, all cash, sight unseen. It's really crazy what we're experiencing. So to answer your question, we're seeing a huge migration in not only tech entrepreneurs, but their companies as well. Okay. Um, okay. Any more right. questions? Got one. Ask me. Ask me. Ask me. Hey, Dana, so, are, are, it, so most of the people moving to the Miami area, is it more younger? They're still working. It's job relocations. It's less retired people. You know, I don't know, actually. I think it's a solid mix. I think we're seeing a solid mix of it. I think um, it's crazy how millennials now are really kind of can really afford million dollar properties, half a million, 1.5, 2 million. So I see, depending on what part of Miami, I think we're seeing the migration from the millennials to the retirees. I do think the retirees are heading more north. I think they're heading towards you. I think the South Florida market is a little younger, younger families. Um, you know, the bachelor from New York, the young couple from L.A. That's that's what I think I'm seeing more. Coral Gables, more family. You know, the beach, the person that wants to come only for six months. That's a big topic. That's a huge selling point, And that's one of my like niches. That's why I'm in the management business, because a lot of New Yorkers just want to come here live for six months for taxes, go back. And that's what I think we're going to see the trend is people coming, relocating for two, three years and then heading back or only coming for a couple of months of the year and going back to where they're from. I see it more of a, of a vacation spot still, instead of a huge full relocation. I think the work from home is also um, you know, a huge play here. Um, so to answer your question, I think retirees a little more north, Surfside, North Beach, Aventura, Fort Lauderdale, and the younger in South Florida, in the you know, Miami Beach, Miami area. Okay. All right, Spencer, why don't you tell us what's going on up in Northern California? Yeah, so I'm Spencer Sue. Uh, I focus mainly of clients in tech. So I, I know what's happening and wanted to just share um, what I see kind of moving forward. So I mainly cover, so I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, but I mainly am in the Silicon Valley side, which is very different than San Francisco as a city. I can talk about San Francisco, but most of my clients are in the Southern parts um, and so our average price points 
for a single family is about 1.6 to 1.8 million for a single family. And um, through the years, it's been interesting because there's always there's a lot of articles about people leaving California. It's partially true, um, but it's also not that true either. A lot of people have left San Francisco, the city, to other parts of the country, and or they just went to other counties that are 10 minutes away. The biggest migration is not to other states, it's to the counties on the side. So single family in places that are a little bit further out, whether it's across the bridge or to like a Sacramento or to a Lake Tahoe, those areas have increased 30% within a year. Um, and here, even in the Bay, core Bay area, it's actually been relatively flat. Single family has been maybe a modest, I don't know, 5% increase through the year. But the biggest change that has happened is over the last two to three months. The last two to three months, especially with a combination of things, the new administration, a combination of vaccines are being rolled out way faster than we may think now. I think Biden wants everybody to have a vaccine by May. So people are seeing that. So there's a lot of people that are moving back to where the main job hubs are again. Because while there's all this commotion about work from home, tech can work anywhere, that's mostly not the case. Most of the time, people understand that they're going to have to be in the office at least three days a week. And they want to be close. So we see a really big tick of prices. In the last two months, prices have increased 15 to 20% for single family around the big tech hubs, which is around Mountain View, around Facebook uh, and Google, these campuses. So it is really interesting to see. It's just getting started. Um, and so that's, it's, it's very exciting. I do see at the same time, oh, there are people that have migrated out what Banna has mentioned about like the uh, about the millennials. I mean, millennials have this stigma or bad rap in the past, but at the end of the day, a millennial is defined now at the age of 39. Because most of them already have pretty established careers. They have some families. And make no mistake, they are really big earners, especially those in tech. I mean, the average Facebook employee average is $200,000. I mean, graduating out of school is $150,000 right? Just out of college as an engineer. Now you pair that with dual income, they can easily afford a lot of these. So that's what I'm seeing here in the Bay Area. San Francisco has its own challenges, uh, but even San Francisco condo markets has picked up in the last couple of months, because I think it goes back, while a lot of companies have decided to move out, in the Bay Area, San Francisco is kind of the only place for a lot of the younger individuals to like have that social life and, and have those activities. So we do see a lot of people going back to the city that they were not looking there even just two months ago. Okay. All right. Anybody have any questions for Spencer? All right, Stuart, I understand you got a little snow there. Yeah, we just had the snowstorm of the decade here. We got three feet in Denver just yesterday in a 24-hour period. So we're all snowed in. It's uh, it's nice and cozy, but that's Denver. You get 300 days of sunshine, so it zaps right away anytime you get a good uh, a good snowfall. But we're our market's crazy. I mean, I'm going to echo a lot of similar things here that have been said, and you know, try not to harp on too much. But Denver. Denver is a uh, it's an interesting market because it's been on pretty much everyone's you know top five top ten uh, growing residential real estate markets list for the past five to seven years. Um, and so going into the pandemic, we were a place where we were getting a lot of you know net positive migration from places like the Bay Area, lots of West Coast, lots of East Coast, DC. Uh, even parts of Florida uh, and certainly New York uh, growth and, and, and relocation here. Um, and that COVID and, and the events of 2020 only proliferated that. So now talking numbers, I mean, we have, we have only 1500 listings on the market uh, today in Denver Metro. And that's for a, that's for a city of 3 million people. So dire, dire low inventory um, and and really everything that's popping up in any price point gets absorbed. Um, anyone working in this market is, is uh, very buyer heavy at the moment. So, I mean, it's to the point where if you're driving around looking for, you know, your buyers in a neighborhood and you're, you're walking up to any backhoe or real estate sign and making a phone call, you're going to see other realtors doing the same thing uh, for their buyers. So we're, we're all hustling. 
um, trying to find listings, trying to find inventory. Um, and for now, you know, we, we aren't really much of a, um, a leasing market, you know, the, the lease the residential real estates really, uh, agents really don't touch leases in, uh, in Denver. Um, but what we do have is, uh, a lot of new apartment buildings going up. And so, um, you know, institutional developers from all over the country, um, are trying to lock in land and build luxury apartment buildings. So at the same time, while we have price growth that's going crazy and um, about an average price point in Denver of six, 630, 630,000, you have a rent growth, actually a rental, um, the rental market's declining um, in prices. So, because there, there is a, a healthy amount of inventory and frankly, a lot of new inventory um, coming online. So that's been a super interesting trend um, for Denver. Um, and then I guess the last thing I'll mention is you know, we have the benefit of being right sandwiched against the Rocky Mountains. And so, um, you know, from we, we call it the front range, Denver's on the front range in the Plains area. And then we have our, our foothill communities um, that are all those first little towns as you enter the Rockies and go towards the resorts like Vail, Aspen, et cetera. Um, those markets have all really blown up from, you know, in the last 12 months. I mean, it's you know, it, list days on market up there easily over 90, closer to 180 days, oftentimes in Golden, Genesee, Evergreen, um, some of these outlying foothill communities of Denver. Now you're talking less than seven days for pretty much anything up there, multiple price uh, um, escalations and, you know, substantial bidding wars. So we're, uh, we're, we're feeling it out here. Send, send listings our way, please. A good problem to have, I guess, that you're doing buyers. Stan, tell us a little bit about New York City. What do we got going there? Yeah, hi, everybody. Nice uh, with you from uh, Manhattan. I think, uh, you know, New York is the first one in, first one out on so many things. When Lehman collapsed, we were the first ones to pause. And uh, unfortunately, COVID uh, really affected New York City uh, right out of the day. Um, and we shut down very quickly. And New York real estate does what it does, um, which is pauses. Um, New Yorkers are not uh, uh, very enticed by seeing market values go down 25 and 30 percent and selling. They hold. Manhattanites like to hold their real estate until real estate comes back. Last year's a perfect example of that. We saw a 30 percent decrease in transactions and an average of only a 5 percent decrease in average pricing. Uh, but the main focus of my work uh, in Manhattan is in the luxury sector. That's for us over the $4 billion mark. Um, and what we saw was a complete freeze up of the market. It was actually part two, uh, part freeze. The first was an increase in our mansion taxes, uh, which had happened in July of 19. And that really had everyone buy in the first half of 19. And then the second half of 19 was a complete pause. And then right around December 15th of 2019, the market exploded again. And right up until the COVID shutdowns, really this week, one year ago, the market was on fire. The market then completely stopped. It stopped all the way through the holidays. And now just since the beginning of the year, we have done more deals over $4 million than we did since 2015. In fact, last week, we did $419 million worth of transactions just nice. last week in the over $4 million category, which is the highest since 2013. So New York City is always that kind of a market. We're a market where either everyone's buying or everyone's paused. And right now, the opportunity is to buy in New York because these numbers will hit the first quarter reports. We're the only city, I think, on the screen today and one of the only cities in the United States not to have an MLS. So we don't have easily accessible market data. Everything is from us pulling contract information. So what I can tell anyone who's watching now, all these great colleagues, um, I look forward to uh, working with everyone who's on today's Zoom, is if you're gonna buy in Manhattan, you wanna try to get that done over these next, let's call it six to 12 weeks until midsummer. Um, that's when buyers, who, sellers who were holding their property back 
market, afraid of what they might get, are going to go into the market. I guarantee you, the New York Times, the New York Post, and the Daily News, and the Wall Street Journal around April 1st are going to be New York City real estate booming. And that will send everybody in. Dan, are you getting people, I read an article last week that people are moving back to the city, like they moved to Florida or Texas or someplace else, and they're now coming back to the city. Is that correct? You know, it's great. Um, I have the fortune of being the sales director, co uh, director with my... Mm, your, your internet's freezing. <laughs> Um, I think that's what the real, oh. real answer is that when people had nowhere to go in the depth of COVID, they went and rented, they went and stayed with their friends, they were glad that their mother-in-law wasn't using the apartment in Miami Beach, that they were staying somewhere else. But the number of sales show from 2020, that 30% decrease I talked about, that mostly people just froze in place. There isn't really a tale of the tape where people sold their apartment in New York, moved out, and want to move back. On the rental market, that is true. People, especially gig economy, our big, huge Broadway uh, community, multi-billion dollar community, left the city. And all they did is say, okay, I'm going to go home to, I grew up in Massachusetts, to Massachusetts, live cheap for a year. I'll drop this $9,000 a month, one bedroom. I've got you know, two blocks in the theater district. And they're able to re-rent that now for, let's say, $62.50, right? So they saved 30 35% in their rent. They're back. Broadway's starting to slowly get ready to reopen over these next few months. And this summer, this city is going to be like a renaissance city with theater and music on every corner of every street and every park. Yeah, I really, I read that your leasing activity is up 116%. So that's a big number. It's a so big I'm number. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Stan? Hey, Alex, why don't you tell us what's going on in Nevada? All right. So I'm right in the middle of Las Vegas, uh, Nevada. And um, one thing uh, about Las Vegas, we have our homes. Uh, project a lot of value here. Our, our average sales price is four hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. So that can get you a great three or four bedroom single family home with a pool, and that's one of the big reasons that Las Vegas is so popular. Um, we're just we're booming um, as a listing agent. Um, every home we list, we're getting between fifteen and twenty-five offers on these homes in the first forty-eight hours, which is great. Um, but, uh, our surrounding States, especially California, um, you know, they can sell their home. there, very similar home for a million dollars buy the same home here for four to 500 and put half a million dollars in the bank. So we've been seeing a lot of that. Um, it's not just California. I've had several clients move from the East coast from Manhattan, um, recently, and uh, they wanted to escape, escape the city. And, uh, we have great weather here. Um, another thing that's, uh, really exciting as we just uh, landed a huge athletic team, the, the Raiders. Um, everyone probably knows that, but that's bringing a lot of excitement to the city. Um, we're reopening. Um, today was our first uh, day of uh, basically a 50% occupancy on all the venues and concerts and things like that. So that's nice. Um, multifamily is huge. We've got some of the biggest developers uh, in the nation building gigantic apartment complexes, uh, high end. Um, very modern uh, styling. Um, there's just not enough uh, homes to purchase. Uh, we still have a lot of land to build, but the builders are 12 months to 24 months out, depending on you know the, the size of the home. Uh, construction materials are all on back order. Um, there's there's waiting lists for for everything. So that's that's wild. Um, even with all that, um, our home prices they've gone up about 25% year over year. Um, which is big for Las Vegas. And what's really cool is um, the, the uber high end. I mean, in Vegas, over 5 million just wasn't heard of a few years ago. Um, in 2020, we had about triple uh, of the amount of homes closed, over $5 million that have ever sold in Las Vegas. And that comes with the territory of athletics, executives moving here, um, 
and uh, we're you know three and a half hours away from from Southern California, so that's become a big hub. We're like a suburb of Los Angeles now. Um, what else was I going to share? Oh, we're finally diversifying here in Las Vegas. Uh, it used to be heavily uh, uh, entertainment based, the hotels and casinos, but some of the biggest companies in the world are are building hubs here. Google and Amazon are the two recent ones that are currently under construction. So that's great. And uh, we're number nine in the entire nation as far as relocation. Um, there's a few other cities in front of us, like North Carolina, that people are moving to, but Vegas is number nine on that map. Um, we can gonna, We think that through the rest of this year, we're going to see those same trends of prices going up, bidding wars, um, there's cash buyers, and people are waiving appraisals that are using financing. So that's contributing to the, the fast bump in prices. And um, we, uh, we do have a foreclosure moratorium. I'm not sure if it's uh, nationwide, but it's supposed to end in Las Vegas, June 30th. And we do expect our inventory to significantly increase when, when that ends. And uh, we'll see what happens. But it uh, should be a good rest of the year uh, for Las Vegas. Are you seeing the people that are coming in buying in Las Vegas, are you seeing a lot of owner-occupied, or are you getting people from, like, Southern California that are coming in and buying a second home and, and keeping that? And maybe um, they're changing their residence. going to go for, was it six months and a day and then back to California? Are you, you seeing know, a lot of that? Yeah, good question, Joseph. We've always had that, that six months and a day for, for Las Vegas and Nevada. Um, but we are seeing people – cashing out on their homes and making Las Vegas their permanent residence. And I would say that's about 80% of the purchases are primary residences, uh, not vacation, not second home. So a lot of, okay. a lot of solid, great families moving here to Las Vegas from other parts of the country. There's some incredible numbers up there. Um, Rod, why don't you tell us a little bit about Beverly Hills and what you got going on over there? I know you're busy. Yeah, man, things are... Things are really good here. Uh, market's still very hot. Um, I'm here in the Los Angeles market, offices in Beverly Hills, but we service primarily in the west side, like I shared before in our, in our opening, when I'm in my opening introduction. A lot of the clients that I work with are on the sports and entertainment side. And so there's been a lot of demand um, just, you know, going into the beginning of this year where we're now a lot of clients who didn't come to Los Angeles towards the, you know, summer because of COVID. We saw things slow down in the second quarter here in Los Angeles, but then in the summer months, things really picked up. So year over year, sales are up 31.6%, uh, which is which is strong when we stay in multiple offers. The issue that we have is we only got one and a half months worth of it. So what that's created is that here in the LA market is, you know, you can find very good quality homes to pick from, but on the new construction side, those homes are really moving quickly, less than 30 days on the market. Sell is still at to you know 100% of asking on those properties that are redeveloped so there's a lot of demand there and I see that continually being the case as we move forward through this year well into the next couple of years uh, here in the LA market um, the other thing too is, is that coastal is really performing really well Malibu I think you know that the community of Malibu has really benefited from the pandemic because what we're a lot of people moving out of the city into the valley in the Malibu coastal areas where we've seen prices jump as high as 30 percent um, in that area, uh, Brentwood's performing really well. Uh, I have a listing in Brentwood that we actually got an offer of $50,000 over at the asking. We were priced at $2,050,000, and uh, the buyer came in $50,000 over asking, and we had multiple offers in that situation on, the, on that particular listing. So demand is still strong. It's still a seller's market. Um, you know, on the rental side, we, we function more on a short rental space. Uh, don't do a lot of additional things, however, average. Um, you know, rent price in Los Angeles is right there about 3500 That's up almost 10% compared to last year this time. On the short-term rental space, I mean, demand is really strong. I mean, on average, most of the rentals that we rent for our pro, pro athletes uh, rent anywhere from about last year, last year this time, anywhere from about 2000 to 25 a, a night. And now that's up to about 3500 a night, depending on the property and which community it's in. Um, but on the luxury side, I, I mean, it's it's still very strong. A lot of demand. <clears throat> buyers are finding it very challenging. Like I have three buyers agents that are us, and it's really been tough for them to get offers accepted on a lot of properties priced between that nine hundred thousand to about you know three million dollars. And then what we're seeing is a large spike in sales uh, from about five million to. 
15 million. Um, I have clients right now, we're having a tough time finding property at six to 10 million range uh, that could pretty much fit that criteria. For. And there's a lot of demand, you know, you know, last year this time, you know, I remember thinking to myself like, and this continue to be the case where prices are spiking going up. And a lot of people doubted that that would happen when, with the pandemic hitting Los Angeles. And of course, nationwide, but not Los Angeles in particular with it being a destination city and us having more, uh, you know, stricter restrictions and everything shutting down. That hadn't been that that wasn't the case. I mean, we saw an influx of you know people from multiple states or uh, other countries coming into LA purchasing secondary homes, especially along the coast. So um, I see that still being the case as we progress and we move forward throughout the rest of this year. And the numbers are actually show, showing that thus far in the first quarter. Well, let me give you some stats here really quick. Uh, so as of right now. <laughs> It's about almost 6,200 homes listed, uh, 27, that 2,700 that have sold. The median price is about 850,000 with 36 days marketing on the market. You know, that's, that's, that, that's strong, you know, for, for Los Angeles, you know, being such a diverse city with, you know, multiple micro markets throughout uh, Los Angeles. Pretty much anything that's central on the west side is, is on fire. What we're seeing is a lot of people pushing down south to like your southern based markets like Long Beach, you know, um, uh, Carson, those areas where, you know, you can probably get a property, purchase a property around the you know, 600 to 800,000 price point. We're seeing a lot of strong demand in that area as well, too, where, you know, you're getting 10, 15, 20 offers on properties that are in that, you know, 700 to a, th- a million dollar price point range in the southern, you know, southern market areas of, of So um, I see things continually, you know, like I shared, being being very strong and, and prices continue to rise here in, in our market. It's absolutely amazing. I really haven't seen this kind of activity in Southern California since like the eighties that I remember. I mean, it's I the gold nice rush. Little... It's the gold <laughs> rush. Right like now. It. He is. Yeah. yeah, it's incredible. And it's just, I thought it was people from moving in from other States. I mean, you're, you're seeing that of course, but people from Northern California that were in San Francisco want to be with land and, you know, Silicon Beach right here to moving from Silicon Valley. It's, it's been, yeah. it's been something, but, um, well, Elizabeth. Just, just an athlete. Tell us a little about, oh, hold on. What's that? What was that, Rod? I was going to say just an, um, athlete and entertainment transactions as well over a billion and a half worth of transactions last year in the LA market. Uh, celebrities, entertainers are buying properties and selling properties in it. And, and we're seeing crazy numbers. We're seeing $50 million properties selling. Um, and in and, and a period of time where a lot of people thought that wasn't going to be the case, but celebrities and entertainers are still flocking to Los Angeles um, and seeking it out as, you know, either secondary place or place to put properties and, you know, kind of just hunker down during this period of time because things are slow in the entertainment industry. You know, production companies have shut down. There's nothing really happening in the movie space. So a lot of people park either here in L.A. or Miami. So uh, that sector is doing well. Okay. All right. Thank you, Rod. Uh, Elizabeth, tell us a little bit about Austin. Mm -hmm. Good old Austin, Texas. Wow. Um, I'm Elizabeth Riley. I'm in Austin, Texas. I have the Lux Property Group brokered by eXp Realty. I have been in business almost 16 years, two different markets. And, um, you know, when I was in the Atlanta market, we were dealing with short sales and foreclosures and we worked super hard. In Austin, it's a completely different experience and we are working probably harder than we've ever worked before. Um, So 2020, I did 77 transactions by myself and thought that was amazing for a pandemic. And then in January of this year, I had 23 under contract in that one month alone. So what, what we're seeing is unheard of right now, year over year, I'm taking the February numbers um, from, from last month to last year. And we're at 36.2% year over year uh, in, in Austin and the surrounding areas. So there's three counties that really kind of make up the, the areas. But what's happening is as soon as the big giants like Tesla um, announced that they were coming our direction and we have Amazon, Google is there, uh, Apple is building you know, a huge campus. Indeed, all these big tech giants are coming our way and our market exploded. So um, January 1st of 2021, where everybody was kind of coming off a crazy year thinking we were going to breathe a little bit. Uh, we had one property going, it was, it was $370,000. It went into a multiple offer situation and had 96 offers come in. 
So we're seeing crazy numbers like that, 78 offers, 50 offers, 32 offers um, that are coming in, especially under the 500,000 price point used to be where a million and above, we would be a little slower. We would, you know, wait a little bit longer on the market, but even those are going into, you know, I think my stats are showing um, anywhere from five to 10 offers and they're 10 to 20% uh, above in the million dollar range, million and a half to 2 million, about five offers, about 10% over. And, you know, I had a client recently that it was a 1.4 house. We put in 260 over and we still lost it. So people are coming in, throwing crazy numbers um, in our market. And typically we trade a lot off market and that's where we've really relied for a while. And that's where a lot of our success has been being able to have those, those conversations and networking, but even those are coming into play now. And there's huge multiple offers. As soon as anybody has any idea that (laughs) there's a market that's even close to coming on market. So Texas is a non-disclosure state. Um, And so that's why a lot of people want to trade off market at this point, because they don't have to disclose the sales price and then the taxes don't adjust and things like that. So um, we're seeing a lot of the execs and people that are coming in from other other states that are willing to pay so much more and willing to waive, I mean, appraisals and uh, financing periods and uh, inspection periods. They're waiving everything and taking all the risk you know, before most of them even see the house. Um, So for us, it's been interesting. Um, We, for February, we had 1400 listings. That's it. Um, Our average days on market right now is five days. Things are flying off the market. We have half a month of inventory, two weeks worth of inventory in our market. So I I think we've all talked about such an inventory shortage right now. Um, I'm not even letting people know about my listings in there until they are absolutely ready to go because it's going to be a free feeding frenzy, no matter where it is. Um, so builders, that's another thing we've been pushing a lot of our buyers to builders because I've been telling them, you know, I know you're qualified. I know you're solid. I know you're with Google, you know, and you have a lot of cash even to cover over the appraisal difference, but I can't promise you we're going to find you a house. You know, and that's a that's a really hard conversation to have with buyers. I'm I'm primarily a listing agent, um, but I'm super buyer heavy right now, as I think everybody else is. And it's just a hard conversation saying, I know you're qualified. Um, so a lot of mine are going through the whole approval process. We just have to find the house so that they can compete with the cash offers. Uh, but with the builders, we've been pushing a lot of them to builds. I have about ten new builds, but that's not even a given anymore. So the builders are seeing. Um, waiting lists upon waiting lists where they'll have 50 or hundred people on a waiting list. And now some of the builders are doing highest and best on lots. It, the house hasn't even been picked. The, um, you know, the, the finishings and the design center hasn't even been, you know, talked about and they're going into highest and best multiple offer situations on lots. And then some of the builders are making people waive whatever the value is going to be, you know, eight to 10 months down the road when the house is finished. And for me, that makes me very nervous because yes, I know what's going on now. We can look historically, but we have no idea what's going to happen, you know, especially in our market eight to 10, 10 months. So it's put everybody in a very um, high stress, high anxiety for these buyers. A lot of them are, our rental market's not moving as quickly as I think everybody expected it to, because they're just staying put. People are like, well, if we can't buy, we're just staying put. Um, and they're buying outside of the city where they can get land or an acre or more space now because most of them won't ever go back into a typical corporate environment or office setting, which is just increasing, you know, everybody's price points. So we have a lot of people living here. Texas doesn't have an income state tax. Um, you know, again, it's non-disclosure. There's a lot of tech. Uh, we have the University of Texas there. So there's a lot of talent coming out of that school. And uh, it's, it's just making it's wreaking havoc on our market. Our sellers are are loving it. But um, again, what we've had to educate our sellers is it's not always the highest price that wins. We really need to look at everything in this market right now uh, because it's really about getting it to the closing table. That's more of a challenge than it has been in the past. Now, are you seeing a lot of people, some of the condo prices in Austin have been, are you seeing people that are looking for homes willing to move into a condo or are they just, they're just waiting? Waiting for the single oh, no. family home. Mm-mm. No, the condos, townhomes, 
multifamily. And like I said, everything is, is being traded off market right now. A lot of mine are, are under contract off market. So condos, it doesn't matter what it is. If it's in Austin, Texas, it's gone. You're seeing the same thing in Dallas too, correct? I'm not sure. Sorry. I'm not sure if Dallas is the same way. Uh, I think everything across Texas is the same. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Everything across Texas is seeing the same thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I have a hard enough time keeping up with my own market. So I'm not really sure what everybody else is, is doing, but Texas is hot. Yeah. Now do you all, this is a question. Oh, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, do you guys all see 18 to 24 months of the market still going to be this hot? Is a trend? Do you think it's going to stay this? I think it will be as long as the rates stay low for my market. And especially with the growth, because we don't even have Tesla there yet. Right. We, they're right. just getting there. And rumor has it is PayPal and SpaceX and these others are going to be following. So um, as, as long as all the attention's on Austin, like it is with the tech uh, people coming our way, because this is very different than when we saw the housing crisis. I mean, these people have money or the dot-com era, right? Dot-com, a lot of those companies just didn't have the, the equity or the, the money yet to be sustainable. Well, this is real money. This is serious money that's coming in and they haven't even all got there yet. So for my market, yes, I absolutely think it will stay strong. Elizabeth, do you guys deal with the like clear cooperation and, and all these off market, you know, issues are, is your, are your board sensitive to clear cooperation or are they kind of turning a blind eye? Um, yes, we're sensitive to it in a way. Um, yes, we try to uh, focus on clear cooperation. So everybody's on the same playing field, but the reality is, is not everybody plays the same. So, you know, some of the off market networks that we're a part of, they're not a member of NAR. They don't have to follow those rules. And so if others are going to take advantage of that opportunity, well, those of us that can will as well for our clients. Um, but they are, they are focused on the fact that, okay, the 24 hour rule is in effect. They're not really, they're, they're more like slapping hands at this point because I don't really know how you police that all that well. So um, there's a lot of education about it. I just don't think there's a whole lot that can be done about it right now. Yeah, the, the agents police it in our market. So we're out here, Liv Sotheby's, we're the number one uh, luxury firm in Denver and we have more complaints than any uh, other brokerage in the area by a long shot, just because agents, you know, think that we have all the buyers and all the sellers and I'll represent all the backdoor deals. But in fact, you know, we're actually some of the most careful about it when they actually look at the firm and how it, how it responds to clear cooperation. So I actually, I had a, a, a chat with someone from Austin not too long ago, probably a month ago that, I mean, she was mentioning the same thing to me. And I was thinking there's no, if we were operating our business that way, I, I could lose my license, which is the crazy yeah. part about market to market, how uh, different, you know, politically just the clear cooperation rule uh, has been, um, I guess, treated. Yeah. The luxury agents in our market, we, like I said, we have access to some other, um, networking uh, opportunities. And uh, most of our luxury is always traded off market. So we've always been operating that way, but um, it's definitely, you know, we're seeing those that are playing by the rules and those that aren't. And in this market, it's, it's almost like everything, anything goes. Um, but I, I see both sides of it. Yeah. I tell you, I've learned a lot today. Stan, I had no idea you guys didn't have an MLS in New York. That, that floored me. This is, this is New York City, but I'll tell you when I hear about the, the kind of cooperation that doesn't go on um, in other markets, uh, and I do a lot of traveling and spend a lot of time in other Sotheby's offices all over the country, and despite the fact that we don't have the MLS, uh, Manhattan is a very, very transparent, very much a market of cooperation, and if anything, uh, these moments where uh, markets pause uh, just bring more relevance to really qualified very experienced brokers also increase uh, the number of buyer agency sides. Uh, so we were starting to see a real drop in buyer agency as buyers went directly to the sales broker. That has dropped and it's a much more equilibrium there. So, uh, you know, it's New York and it's a gold rush uh, here too. Uh, it's just that the gold rush in New York never stops uh, because people come here from all over the world all the time. So as many people as might leave New York City in any six month period, we've got five more people right behind every single one of them. 
looking for a home, looking for a job, looking to live here. So uh, I'm very proud to be a New Yorker uh, and very happy for all of us uh, to be on a call like this because about 11 months ago, I think we were all uh, checking under our couch to see where the quarters were uh, just in case things went wrong and I was buying uh, you know, solar chargers for my phone uh, to make sure I would still have electricity. So isn't this nice uh, to be at the end of this, nearing the end of it, and to be with a group of uh, really great brokers and, and hear such positivity, challenges, but such positivity. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm glad New York is coming back. I know it's been a tough road. Um, and I'm thankful to all of you. I mean, uh, hearing your guys' numbers, it's absolutely insane. I appreciate you guys taking the time to do this. Um, thank you for uh, giving us all this data. I think it's very important because you know, we read all these different real estate publications. You get all this different information, so it's great to hear it right from people who are actually in the field every day. So um, thank you. Now we'll be um, wrapping this up at the end. So if anybody has any other questions for anybody else, we can go ahead now. Okay. All right. So if uh, to our viewers, you see these agents, I'm going to have all their contact information at the bottom of the video. Make sure you reach out to them. Um, they know what they're doing. Obviously, you've listened for the last hour talking about the markets. They know their stuff. So these are the people you want to be talking to in these markets. Uh, if you haven't done so, uh, make sure you go down and subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure you like this video. So, all right. Thank you very much.